attendees attending, attending to him. So uh, the other thing I was mentioning to Bill, this talk, I may have set it up a little or a lot below the level of the people out there. I didn't have a good grasp of the audience, so I apologize for that. And we can go through what's elementary to you. So, so we're going to talk about chest pain, which, uh, as Hattie said, is low risk, high stakes. And we'll see how we can fish out of the mass of individuals, literally millions, who come to the emergency department every year within that group, who are the really high risk people. So I always have to have uh, conflicts have to be noted. And I, mine are uh, only my inner conflicts, <laughs> which I will not share with you. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get the slide. Oh, okay, so here's, here's the outline of what we're going to talk about. Chest pain is the great mimic. It can masquerade as coming from innumerable sources. A colleague, another colleague of mine, wrote a chapter in a book on pain a few years ago. We did the chapter on chest pain. And to make the table, to put the table in there, to include everything, we had to do landscape, you know, put pages sideways, and they went down over several pages. So the causes are innumerable. We'll talk about the causes first. And then this may be insulting to you, what's a heart attack? And I've been asked to talk about a little bit about the issue of women and diagnosing a heart attack in women. Then the chest pain units that we have run for about 20 years at UCD. And then something about the guidelines for one type of heart attack that we did a couple of years ago. So it was a lot, and, uh, but it was still very honored, a much a great honor to be here. And I love talking about this, these unfortunate issues. I love talking about it because maybe through our discussions and understanding, we can alter, alter what's going on. You know, since the beginning of the 20th century, the tide of heart disease deaths went up, 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 up into the 50s and 60s. And since then, it's been coming down, 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 down. It's kind of leveled <laughs> off now due to the epidemic of obesity, which leads to an epidemic of diabetes, which supports the de epidemic of heart disease. Not having diabetes isn't a guarantee. One won't have coronary disease and an infarct. But we'll talk, you've already heard some excellent ways to check oneself. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So first, the causes. I knew red does not show if there's a lot of light. It's not a good color. We all like it, but I did it with, with trepidation. But let's go on and talk about this. The cardiac cause, the, there are cardiac causes, that's what we're most concerned about, and the lesions in the coronary artery, the plaque rupture, you've already heard the term. We will address that, but then there are multiple other causes. So it's a huge challenge, and we sometimes are, in, in the past, we're at that stage, now we think we're a little better at it, but still a tremendous challenge because of all the causes. I don't want us to look at this. I don't apologize for a busy slide, the usual cliche. I just want you to see a partial list from a partial group of organs. Here are the cardiac causes, ischemia. This is going to be the heart attack. These are causes. But there are other cardiac causes that can be confused with a heart attack. And then we have GI causes. You've all heard about GERD, gastroesophageal reflux, <coughs> musculoskeletal arthritis of the, spa, of the sternum and the ribs can give the pain. Cervical radiculitis, compression of a nerve root can cause pain radiating around anteriorly. And it's a wonderful book this came from, but it left out what I think is the major cause of patients coming at least to our ED with chest pain, and it's somatoform disorders. Stress, anxiety, panic attacks, that turns out to be the largest cause. Within this huge cause of chest pain, we have to identify what is ischemia, you know, ischemia meaning the heart muscles not getting enough blood, and the extreme of that is a myocardial infarction. 
This is what the students need to learn as they move through our course. And I've been emphasizing what a challenge it is. This statement or a piece of a poem of poetry, the best in this kind are but shadows, is from Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. We're dealing with some shadows and they're not always concrete, they're frequently abstract, and this is what we're up against. So it is a huge challenge. Let's just look at chest pain as a cause of all the patients who come to the emergency department with chest pain. One, the most frequent, it is the most frequent cause in adults causing them to come to the emergency department. Chest pain and abdominal pain are the two largest causes. It's anywhere from five to 10 million visits a year to the emergency department for chest pain. Most causes are not cardiac. There are so many other organs in the chest and even in the abdomen. You saw gallbladder disease can cause chest pain. Most causes are not only not cardiac, they're not life-threatening. But this is still our biggest killer. So within all of this morass, within these weeds, we've got to find the, the, the killer, the deadly one. There is a high frequency. We, we discharge patients from the, uh, from the emergency department after a few hours. That's considered good if it's safe. Fast, accurate, cost-effective, but accurate is the big thing. And now that chest pain units have come to, to uh, function at many hospitals around the country, we do have very safe and accurate ways of detecting the people who need to be admitted and those who come with non-cardiac causes and non-serious causes that can be worked up and evaluated outside, don't have to congest the emergency room and reduce the workflow where we need beds and space for people who are having the problem that we're talking about. So now we have in red the major heart attacks, 3% of all presentations to the emergency department. <coughs> Very low, it's below 5%. That's the big one, the one that we have to go, and we say here, this is the fire drill, to the catheterization lab, a lot of things happen in between, to place, to open the artery and place a stent. Under 5%, eight, five to 10 million visits. Most people that die suddenly, obviously never got to the emergency room, and many of the deaths are sudden and in unsuspecting victims, as you just heard. There are other heart attacks that aren't the big ones. That's what we wrote the guideline on. They are about 20 to 30 percent of causes of people coming to the, uh, to the emergency bot with chest pain. So you see, when you add it all up, it's still a minority of people that come to the ER with chest pain are really having heart attack or any of the several other life-threatening problems. And I want to go back for a second. No, we'll go forward. So what is a heart attack? And I'm sure many of you are familiar, but I want to go over it again a little bit so we, we're all on the same page. The coronary arteries. The coronary arteries, you heard the term plaque. That occurs, the plaque occurs usually in, oh, very nice. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the right coronary artery, its branches, the left main coronary, the anterior descending, the left, it is the major supplier to most of the muscle. And then the left circumflex artery moving <coughs> around back. The, the, the plaques that rupture, and cause clots, thrombi, in the, in the vessel usually are related to plaques in the first three to four centimeters of the artery when they're uh, traveling on top of the muscle. Then the artery plunges down into the muscle. But these, this is just a partial uh, diagram. The, they, what we say is the vessels arborize. They divide and divide and divide like roots on a tree, infinitesimally. Now here's, here's where we will talk about what we've just heard. So this is a timeline of atherosclerosis. The first decade, 
the third, the second, and the third decade, and the fourth decade. So we're looking at a sideways, a longitudinal view. Things are fine in childhood, and we start to get toward a little older, around puberty. You notice the artery, the wall is getting a little thicker and thicker as we move into the third decade. Third decade, so we're in our 20s, and we're starting to lay down the plaque. This is from partly genetics, but a lot of it is from our lifestyle. The intake, the, the enemy is saturated <coughs> fat. The other extreme, if one wants to really do what I consider the right thing, is go to the plant-based diet. And everybody, ooh, oh, ah, can't do that. Well, that's the lowest fat diet there is, the plant-based diet. You get everything you need, all the protein we need from the legumes, take uh, uh, some vitamins. So few of us do that. But the closer we get to that, and the lower our intake of animal protein, animal protein is not a good way to get protein. It comes with a lot of fat. And saturated fat is what makes the low density lipoprotein cholesterol that then goes in to the underneath the, the smooth lining of the artery and makes the plaque. And here's the lipid content as we move into the fourth decade, the 30s and beyond. This is the fat that's in the vessel. Some vessels have a thick cap, some vessels have a thinner cap. The more <coughs> risk factors we have, smoking, high blood pressure, uh, in, physical inactivity, that enhances inflammation, that wears away the, the cap, the fibrous cap over this plaque, which then can finally rupture when the blood meets the contents of the plaque, it's like an atomic bomb going off inside the vessel. And platelets, the little, the little uh, bodies in the blood that help us not bleed to death when we shave and cut ourselves, or, or trauma and we cut ourselves, it plugs up the hole, they start getting very active. They think we're bleeding because uh, the body is smart, but it's not 100% smart. They think we're bleeding. The contents of the plaque have now activated the platelets, and we now have what you heard about, a thrombus, a, a clot in the vessel. Now, uh, there's, there's the, OK, sorry. Uh, now, we're going to move a little bit. You see here, it shows the plaque having ruptured, and there's a clot there. By the time the vessel gets, the, the uh, plaque gets this severe, usually there's angina, because the blood flow is not adequate to meet the needs as we run up a stairs or run through an airport carrying luggage or do jogging or play tennis. But over here, there's plenty of room in this artery. This is a plumbing issue. The artery is 50% narrowed. The blood flow can go up when we need to, in most instances, adequately. So we're unaware. Again, you heard about this earlier today. The blood flow can go up, and we are unaware. We're fine, we think. When we get into this level, then we'll start having angina. And even then, the sensory mechanisms in all of us differ. And even then, we might not uh, sense the chest pain that is a that is a very good warning of nature, something's wrong. Stable angina, get angina when you're uh, active, stop, the pain goes away, that's angina, and then we must get evaluated. But down here, we, we really don't have any evidence in terms of our physical activity that uh, we're in danger. And many of the heart attacks occur from plaques rupturing down here. And that explains to us, we've only understood this since the early 90s, that that explains when the spouse or other loved one comes in and says to the doctor, while the patient is in the throes of a myocardial infarction, how could that be? He never had, or she never had any symptoms of heart problems. Well, the sobering fact is that the majority of 
uh, manifestations, initial manifestations that something is going wrong with the coronary arteries, the majority are catastrophes, a heart attack or sudden death. That's the major way, the most frequent way that coronary artery disease presents. Lucky people present with angina. The active chest pain goes away in a couple of minutes. I better see the doctor. I better get evaluated. The majority don't have a shot. They have a shot by preventive. Preventive approaches is what will reduce the epidemic of coronary artery disease. So here's, this is not behaving. Everybody knows what a heart attack looks like. I want to show you just, uh, myocardial infarction will destroy yeah, you know, the, it's my thick fingers that are doing this. I'm going to go double. I'm going to go with a pointer in one hand, two-handed, like Japanese ball players coming over who can hit and pitch. Okay, so here's the heart attack. Depending on where the block is, it will be massive if the block is up here, or not massive, but every heart attack, there are no minor heart attacks, no okay heart attacks. But, but it will not be as life-threatening if it's down here. That's the point of this slide. So two types. This, this reviews what we just went over. There's a plaque. The artery is going up and, up and down. It's longitudinal, but vertically now. So here's the plaque. With inflammation, the plaque, the cover, erodes, and the contents and the blood meet. And as I said, atomic bomb, there's a thrombus. Here's the artery again, total occlusion. And here, it's not always total, it can be almost total. It's still an, a heart attack, the kind we call non-ST elevation, and I'll show you what we mean by that, or ST elevation. This is the one, fire drill, doesn't matter when, on the way to the cath lab. And it's this content, this picture, is reflected in the electrocardiogram. The simple $25, $35 electric cardiogram. It's the first thing that when a ch chest pain, an adult comes in with chest pain, the EKG is the first thing to see if it's an ST elevation MI, and then everything stops and the patient is rushed to the cath lab because we think this is what's going on. And the person has to have the right symptoms and, and the whole picture. Very quickly, within 10 minutes, the decisions are made. Now, we're going to see, oh no, no. We're going to see, what do we mean by ST elevation, ST depression? So everybody, not everybody, a lot of people here have had an um, EKG. So this is that little line right there is the ST segment. This is what we look at, one of the very important things when you get a treadmill test or when you come in with chest pain, because if it's like this, you see this, is now like this, and there are 12 leads, they don't all show it, but key ones show it, then that's ST elevation, and until proven otherwise, the patient is considered to have a, a big clot in the artery, like I just showed you, and this is the one where it's depressed. This line is now like that. And the problem with the EKG is other things can do this, so we're back again, meeting the challenge, the, it's the art of medicine and the knowledge of medicine, to know when this means the big one and when this means a heart attack or unstable angina, worse than just stopping and the pain goes away, much worse, uh, so that there are other things, it's very important to realize that. And the whole history is being taken and the rest of the information. Here's ST elevation compared to that. Look how high that is. And then here's ST depression. This is a 12 lead ECG. I was showing you, there's the ST depression like that. You should have a nice line like that. Other things can do it, but when all that's put together, the age of a person, the risk factors, the symptoms, and the electric cardio, this is still our first test. It is just amazing. Nothing has replaced that in the first minutes of the evaluation. Now, this is a slide showing the cardiac injury markers. What was released into the blood when this, when the heart attack occurs, the myocardial infarction, that is damaged muscle. 
and some of the contents of the cells of the heart leak into the blood, and we can measure those. They shouldn't be in the blood, and with certain ones, and when they go up like this, these are each different. This is our, our most important one now, troponin, going up very high. This is one we used to use. It's been replaced by troponin, and even troponin, now it's high sensitivity troponin, which is extremely sensitive. And it go, they go up within a couple of hours, and then the troponin may last a day or two, sometimes even more. So we put that together. The problem is the EKG still for the first minutes supersedes it because it takes time for the blood to get to the lab, for the test to be done, for the answer to come back. So still we're waiting for the troponin, but we don't wait if we see the ST elevation to the cath lab. And cardiac injury markers, sorry, troponin is the preferred marker and that's what you're going to be hearing when you say his blood tests are up, his enzymes are up. Troponin is a protein, not an enzyme, it's a protein of heart muscle. It's very sensitive. I was asked to say something about a heart attack in women. Women have heart attacks. I'm going to say this right now. When you compare the sexes, women, you are physiologically much better specimens than we are. Before the last decade or two, I heard when I was in training, women are the superior sex. Double X chromosome, men are broken chromosomes. A Y chromosome is a broken chromosome. So that's why men are the inferior sex. Physiologically, it is true. Women get every disease later than men, live longer than men. The population over 90 is highly populated with women to the small minority of men. So having said that, women are not invulnerable. And after the menopause, then the heart attack rate rises very high, but never catches up to the frequency of heart attack in men. We want to be uh, very careful and very helpful and work very hard to prevent heart attacks in men and women, but these are facts we want to recognize. It doesn't mean women should take it easy and uh, have the imprudent lifestyle. We all need an imprudent lifestyle. So here, here are the symptoms. I want to make sure that we're on. Okay, here are the symptoms of heart attack and the issue. I've been very interested in this. There is the word out there, and there's a misunderstanding that women have these weird symptoms and they're extra hard to diagnose heart attack. So let's look at this. These studies were done ten, over 10 years ago. All acute <coughs> coronary syndromes, that's heart attack, unstable angina, the bad things. 70% of women versus 72% of men present with chest pain. Women do not present with pain in the pinky or the big toe as a heart attack. I'm being ridiculous, but, but this has gotten out of hand, this idea. Now, <coughs> I think, let me show you one other piece. I'm, I'm talking to you about the evidence. Six out of eight studies of myocardial infarction, no difference in the frequency of chest pain in men and women, more than 90% of women presented to the ER with chest pain. The women that have the big heart attack, the ST elevation, that are rushed to the cath lab, crushing chest pain. Women get this older. They get these problems when older than men. The onset starts to go up about 10 years after the menopause. The average age of menopause in this country is 51 years old. So in the 60s, it starts going up. But a diabetic woman who smokes can easily have a myocardial infarction in her 30s or 40s. So women do get heart attacks at younger age, but usually there's a, a very high risk profile for this, diabetes, smoking. So now the PROMISE study. This was published two years ago. It was a very large study. And one of the things of it was evaluating the presenting symptoms of coronary disease in women and men. 10,000 subjects, 5,000 women and 5,000 men. And here's what they found. Primary symptom in women, chest pain, for Corner, as, as evidence of coronary disease, 73%. Men, 72%. Crushing, pressure, squeezing, tightness. Those are the 
the severe symptoms of coronary disease, angina, heart attack, 53% in women, 46% in men. So quite parallel. So it may be that women, the other 50% or the other 27% do have atypical symptoms. But when I say it's gotten out of hand, the majority of women do not present atypically. There may be more, inf more frequent atypical symptoms. I'm not even convinced of that. I think the atypical symptoms, this is a hypothesis, I don't have evidence, it relates to older individuals. That we know, older individuals. And women have their <coughs> infarct when they're older, in general, older. That doesn't, again, mean women don't have infarcts when they're young. So I hope I've laid that to rest based on the evidence available. Anecdotes don't really make evidence. We do have men and women come in with atypical pain, but it's important we understand this. Dr. Amos, could you just go back one slide? Maybe that's, well, it, uh, the crushing pressure, squeezing tightness, can you just talk about that a little bit and whether some people have that without the chest pain? Oh, that is a great point, Hattie, thank you. When we ask the patient, when we see him, he's come into the ED, uh, can it, it, so I, I see on the note you're having chest pain. I'm not having pain, I'm having pressure. I'm having tightness. It feels like an elephant or a truck on my chest, but it's not pain. And this is internal, it's deep in the chest, so it's not a sharp pain like you're stuck with a knife. When a person tells you that, the likelihood that it's cardiac goes down very much, that it's coronary goes down very much. It's a diffuse pain, deep, hard to describe. And so some people say crushing, some people say a pressure, a squeezing, and tightness. These are the classical ones, but you have to work to get that out, because they'll say, I don't have pain, I have tightness, or I have a squeezing. So that's a very good point. Thank you. So from the PROMISE study, the data I just showed you, the quote from the paper, providers need to know that in the majority of cases, women and men with suspected heart disease have the same symptoms, suspected coronary disease. That's gonna surprise some people. Now I wanna throw this in too, because there is a center or two in the country that talks about heart attack being the major cause of mortality in women throughout their adult ages. Throughout their adult ages. Uh, here we're looking, this is uh, CDC data, the latest, 2013. It takes them a few years to get all the data together and publish it every couple of years. So here's percent uh, on the vertical axis, and the blue bars indicate death from cancer, the red indicate death from heart disease. Here are the ages and decades from 35, 44, uh, all the way up to over 85. Blue is cancer, red is heart disease. 35 <coughs> to 44, 45 to 54, 55, et cetera, et cetera. It's cancer at younger ages. And we need to uh, ensure that because some of this concern about women and telling pe people that, this, that, uh, that heart attack is the biggest cause of uh, death in women at all ages has scared women and has caused a lot of unnecessary anxiety. That doesn't mean people should be living the prudent lifestyle to protect what happens up here. There are so many deaths in women at this age when heart disease becomes the primary that one can say if you average this over the lifetime, it is the chief cause of death in women. Beats cancer by a little bit if you average it, but that's misleading. That is misleading. So that's another important fact. This is CDC data. So 